The interaction between the environment and peoples throughout the world affects the quality of life on this planet. As citizens of our community, we can participate in decisions impacting our city, state, and nation. In this series, we explore the effects of our influence on the Earth's ecosystems, as well as alternatives and solutions. This is Eco News with your host, Nancy Perlman. Environmentalists, social activists, medical authorities, educators, and animal rights experts address the fundamental moral and ethical issues related to our diets and to the environmental crisis now facing humanity. Hello, I'm Nancy Perlman. On this edition of Eco News, we feature the second half of the documentary, A Sacred Duty, Applying Jewish Values to Help Heal the World, written, photographed, and directed by Lionel Friedberg for the group Jewish Vegetarians of North America. Regardless of your religious or ethical beliefs, you will find the film meaningful to your life. Despite the availability of newer, cleaner technologies such as wind and solar power, Society, as a whole, has steered clear of them, stubbornly refusing to ease our reliance on dirty fossil fuels. While most people usually associate global warming only with vehicle and industrial emissions, there is far more to the story than that. Much of the greenhouse gases spewing into the atmosphere comes from a surprising source. In 2006, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations released a startling report. It revealed that 18% of greenhouse gases come from none other than livestock agriculture. Farm animals and the many systems that support this huge industry produce more greenhouse gases than all the trucks, cars, trains, aircraft, and ships of all the nations of the Earth combined. This is one of the least known and seldom discussed aspects of global warming. There are other environmental ramifications behind animal agriculture. In the United States alone, nearly 200 million tons of cereals, grains, and soybeans are produced every year. If all these crops were fed to people, it would be an efficient way of getting healthy protein into the human diet. But that is not what happens. Most of it is fed to animals. They are then slaughtered to provide meat for human consumption. Because most of the plant matter fed to the animal goes towards maintaining its needs or eliminated as waste, only a small proportion of the crop is converted into protein for humans. It takes up to 10 pounds of grain to produce only one pound of beef. Soybeans are one of the richest sources of vegetable protein. 10 acres under this crop could provide sufficient nutrition to feed 60 people. The same acreage of land devoted to raising cattle will provide enough protein for only two people. Our planet has a fixed size and it has a fixed number of people that it can hold and feed. In other words, it, that same land if it were used for purely for growing food for vegetarian and vegan diets, would feed many, many more people. Almost a third of the Earth's arable surface is now being used for grazing and for growing animal feed. Vast tracts of forested land in the Amazon have already been destroyed to make way for pastures for cattle and for raising the crops to feed them.
meat production also wastes another precious resource. It takes between 2,500 and 5,000 gallons of water to produce just one pound of beef. The environmental destruction caused by the animal agriculture industry, by the amount of dung produced, by the amount of sewage that gets poured into our waterways and our systems, there's no doubt it is damaging our world. And it is in violation of the Jewish mandate to protect and observe and care for the earth. We are ignoring things that are essential and critical to the character of Judaism in order to meet our selfish desires and wants. Meat consumption is not only harmful to the environment, but to human health. With growing concern about foods that may cause illness, obesity, and even death, people are increasingly questioning what they eat. According to Jewish tradition, taking care of one's body is a mitzvah, a sacred duty. Take you therefore good heed of yourselves for your souls. Deuteronomy 4, verse 15. The principle of Nishmate Ma'odle Nafshotechem, you shall take great care of your souls, is understood to be the principal responsibility to preserve our own health. And of course, we have a responsibility to care about the health of others. In certain respects, that's even greater because um, disregarding the health of others is, of course, transgressing the commandment to love one's neighbor as oneself and therefore to be uh, responsive to the needs of others. Poor health as a result of diet is a worldwide problem. There are so many terrible degenerate diseases that come from the way we live, it's partly the air we breathe, it's partly the lack of exercise, it's partly the level of tension in society in our daily lives, but a lot of it is specifically what we eat and the fact that Americans eat fast food, even kosher fast food, which is full of fat and doesn't have the, the vitamins and minerals you need in it, which has excessive protein, which is fried or produced in other damaging ways. About half of all Americans die of heart attacks and strokes, and about 30% of adults die of cancer as well. So these are diseases predominantly of nutritional extravagance and nutritional stupidity. Nobody has to have a heart attack. I mean, in America, we eat 40% of caloric intake from animal products. And of course, we eat 50% of caloric intake from processed foods. That leaves over only about, you know, under 10% of calories from unrefined plant foods, from fruits, and vegetables, beans, nuts and seeds, foods that are full of antioxidants and phytochemicals. Americans are eating a diet of all animal products and processed foods. With that little bit of, you know, 5% of calories we eat from fruits and vegetables isn't sufficient. The diet to be healthy has to be mostly the vast majority, fruits and vegetables, beans, nuts and seeds. In the beginning, the Torah was explicit on the ideal form of human diet. God said, Behold, I give unto you every herb-bearing seed that is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree that has seed-yielding fruit. It shall be food for you and to all the animals of the earth, to every bird of the sky, and to everything that moves on earth within which there is a living soul. Every green herb I give you all for food. And it was so. Genesis 1 verses 29 to 31. From an ideal point of view, this world should have been a vegetarian world. It was only after the, uh, the flood with Noah and after humankind sort of came lower on a moral base and, and its ethical values were lower, only then was meat permitted uh, to human beings. There's no doubt about it that from a, an ecological point of view, 
simply even I'd say mathematical point of view, vegetarianism is a much more calculated way to manage this world. And there is indeed a, a direct ideological connection between responsible stewardship and vegetarianism. I'm a vegetarian precisely because I am a believing Jew who strives to live in accordance with the ethical teachings of my heritage. Now, I don't mean to say that anybody who is not a vegetarian is not living in accordance with the teachings of their heritage, but I believe that if you do follow the most sublime and noble values in our tradition and in this day and age, then there is an imperative to lead a vegetarian lifestyle. There's the question of all the hormones and antibiotics that are pumped into the animals, that are retained at the end of the food chain so much more intensely, which render the question of whether this is the right health diet that one should be following um, when there are alternative diets available. So these factors are in fact Jewish factors. They are issues of uh, looking after one's health is a halachic uh, imperative. Compassion for animals is a halachic imperative. Um, being responsible also for your environment and for your globe, which also have ramifications coming out of the whole question of the meat industry and meat consumption, are all fundamental Jewish questions. So I simply put, I'm a vegetarian because I am a religious Jew. The question is often asked, how can you be Jewish and follow a vegetarian diet? Isn't it enough to merely keep kosher? Living a kosher life, it's not only about whether you have meat and dairy separated or whether you say your prayers every morning. These are important things. But where is the morality? We also have to look at how are we in our behavior affecting others, affecting other humans, affecting the environment, affecting animals, that God did not give us these laws just so that we could make sure that we have a, a phony uh, flavored something to uh, taste like this, so that's kosher and this is dairy, but it's not really dairy because it's really soybeans. These are not the only reasons we're told to keep kosher. Kosher is a system that has to do with our interaction with the environment. We praise God for giving us these foods. We praise God for the fruits of the tree. We praise God for the fruit of the earth. And if we are not caring for that earth, or if those fruits are filled with chemicals that are making us sick, or if the animals that we're eating are so filled with hormones and antibiotics that they're likely to cause cancer, then I don't believe we're really keeping kosher in the moral, spiritual sense that God gave it to us for. Although in the beginning vegetarianism was commanded by God, a later passage in the book of Genesis reverses the original decree that humanity should follow a vegetarian diet. After the story of Noah and the flood, there are these words. They carry a shrouded and ominous message. The fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every animal of the earth and upon every bird of the heavens, in everything that moves on earth and in all the fish of the sea. Into your hands are they now delivered, every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. Like the green herbs, I now give you everything. Genesis 9, verses 2 and 3. The more sentient the being is, the greater the responsibility is upon humanity to be caring for it. And that is precisely the meaning in Genesis when we are told to go and assume our responsibility over the animal kingdom. That responsibility must be understood first and foremost in terms of compassion and care for animals. And there are therefore fundamental prohibitions under the category of preventing Sa'al Bali Chayim, suffering to animals, that are explicit in the Torah, for example, 
the prohibition to muzzle an ox when it is plowing so that the animal should be able to graze or even of plowing with two different kinds of species where one might be strong and the other might be weak or not slaughtering a mother and its child on the same day. So being compassionate towards animal life is not just a matter of being responsible for animal life, which we have very clearly laid down in the Torah and expounded by our sages, but it's a matter of imbuing ourselves with the right kind of values. If we are insensitive towards animal life, then we desensitize ourselves as human beings. Though the Torah teaches that only humans are created in God's image, Judaism has much to say about the similarities between people and animals. The fate of men and the fate of animals, they have one and the same fate. As one dies, so does the other, and they all have the same spirit. Man has no superiority over animal, for all is futile. All go to the same place, all originate from dust, and all return to dust. Who perceives that the spirit of man is the one that ascends on high, while the spirit of the animal is one that descends down into the earth? Ecclesiastes 3, verses 19 to 21. The meat most Jews eat today is not the meat their parents ate, their grandparents ate. That meat uh, was raised in a very different way. The meat we eat today is part of a, a terrible process of factory farming and has turned the kosher slaughterhouse into a travesty of what it was. Kosher slaughter 100, 200 years ago was respectful of the animal, was, uh, c considered the animal to be sacred, and for th maybe thousands of years was truly the most merciful way of killing an animal and now it has become simply a quick step in an assembly line process. But David uh, says in the books of Psalms, Tov Hashem lakol God is good to everything and his mercy is upon everything he has created. Now main idea of, of uh, religion, Jewish and I think other religions as well, is that we should try to imitate the ways of the, of, of the Lord. He is good, He is merciful, he, he, he is just. We should stick to His ways. We should go and try to do whatever He is I, the ideal, and we should try to imitate His way. Now, if He is merciful, we should be merciful. We shouldn't be cruel. We live in something of a parallel universe today. Beyond the fences and barriers of the meat industry lies a world that few outsiders ever get to see. But as long as humans crave the flesh, milk and eggs of other creatures, it will continue to exist. In defiance of the Torah's fundamental teachings of tsar ba'alei chayim, or prevention of cruelty to animals, suffering is rife. It is an inevitable byproduct of a massive industry in which over 50 billion animals are slaughtered every year, eight times the total human population of the Earth. Long gone are most family farms. Today's animal products come from intensive confinement facilities or factory farms. Egg-laying hens are crammed five to eight to a cage giving each bird less space than a sheet of writing paper. Because frustration and overcrowding cause fighting and pecking, baby chicks have their beaks seared off by a hot blade without anesthetic before they are caged. Unwanted male babies are simply discarded, still alive and fully conscious. Broiler birds, destined for slaughter, are crowded together by the tens of thousands. They are invariably pumped with antibiotics to ward off disease and promote weight gain. Their final journey to slaughter is usually a brutal one. 
Many birds are severely injured or cut to shreds on bleed lines that move too swiftly. In the United States, the kill rate is staggering. 10 billion birds a year, over 300 every second. Calves are taken away from their mothers at birth, making their milk available to the dairy industry. The calves are tied up in tiny crates, preventing muscular development so that their flesh remains tender, as demanded by veal consumers. Atrocities during the slaughter of cattle are prevalent. While Jewish slaughter laws, or shechita, aim to minimize pain, ritual kashrut slaughterhouses, like this one in Iowa and another in Nebraska, have been exposed for gross violations and cruelty. Can we really stand by and permit this horrific, widespread mistreatment of animals? It's, it's really so contrary to so many beautiful teachings about the proper treatment of animals. Judaism teaches that we have to be compassionate. We, God's compassion extends to all creatures, and we are to imitate God's positive attributes, including that of compassion. You know, out of sight may mean out of mind for many people, but if we permit others to, to, to be involved in these horrible atrocities, just to, for our benefit, to put meat on our plates, for example, then uh, we have to consider that we are equally responsible. Behold, I establish my covenant with you and with your offspring after you, and with every living being that is with you, with the birds, with the cattle, with all the animals of land with you, with all that departed from the ark, with all the animals of the earth. Genesis 9, verses 9 and 10. As humankind's shadow extends ever more ominously across the face of planet Earth, the time has come for us to look anew at our ancient teachings. Answers lie within our grasp. Perhaps as never before has there been a time more critical or more opportune to make a difference. We've got to change our consciousness. We've got to change our actions. We've got to make the saving of the planet a central focus on everything we do, on all of our actions. And we've got to start this right away. There's been far too much delay already. If we don't, what will be the effects on our children? What are the ramifications for our grandchildren, for future generations? Think about this. If we don't start acting and acting soon, what kind of world will we leave behind? We have to be respectful of ourselves, of our bodies. We have to be respectful of the earth, of nature. And we have to be respectful of all the creatures we share this earth with. Part of our traditions and our sacred duty as Jews is to come back to this wonderful reverence for everything that is alive in this world. We as Jews being commanded by God to care for this world that he gave us need to take up the banner of ecological responsibility and of ecological consciousness and to incorporate into our kosher lifestyles those things which lead us to be compassionate, to be moral, and to be responsible in caring for this planet. I call heaven and earth today to bear witness against you. I have placed before you life and death, blessing and curse, and you shall choose life so that you may live, you and your offspring. Deuteronomy 30, verse 19.
I hope that this film has motivated you to respond quickly to help shift our imperiled planet to a sustainable path. And for viewers who would like more information, please call or write. On behalf of our nonprofit organization, Educational Communications, I'm Nancy Perlman wishing you a natural, unspoiled environment. <laughs>